existed, but I can tell you the answer for the vast majority of people out there, outside the doors here, what their answer is. And their answer here in the US, in the UK where I live, in Australia where I used to live, in Canada, everywhere around the world, their answer is no. We should not care. The fewer languages, the better. The world will be a better place if we cut out all this bloody diversity and stop people speaking all these funny languages. We will have a better understanding of each other if everybody would just speak one language. Mutual communication would be improved, global peace would break out, economic pre uh, <coughs> pressure would be removed, and so on. Now, this argument, I hear this argument. I go on radio talk shows in, in, in the UK, or I've done the same thing here in the US. People say, let them stop speaking. It costs us a huge amount, all this translation and rubbish. Let everybody just speak one language. Well, that sounds like a reasonable argument, but it's incredibly naive. And there are tons of counterexamples. Here in this country, you had a massive war that resulted in huge loss of life. In the Civil War period, it was speakers of English fighting speakers of English. It was nothing to do with language. Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Croatia, they all speak roughly the same language, but they had enormous wars during the Balkans. You can give more and more examples. Was usually people, when people come back to me and say, um, um, oh, you know, we should all speak one language. I say, yes, I agree with you, okay? We should all from tomorrow speak mm. Okay, mu is a fantastic language. It's got 75 click sounds, it's got nasalized vowels, it has a tone system. It is the most beautiful language in the world. Let's give up English and all speak mu. Of course, the answer is going to be no, you know, we should all be speaking <laughs> English or Mandarin Chinese or Spanish or something like that. Okay, so that argument is pretty silly, but it is one that is, is repeated and it's one that we need, do need to confront. Should we care? Yes, because we need diversity. The world, diversity in the world is a, a good and positive factor. Yes, because languages express identity. This is a very strong argument, I believe, in that in many communities, the language that you speak is connected with your identity, your social and cultural identity. And what you find in many indigenous communities in particular is that when the language is taken away, people feel that part of themselves has been taken away. They have lost their identity, their sense of who they are, the sense of their connection with their relatives, with the past, with their um, uh, origins. And so for many people, language is an expression of their social and cultural and individual identity. Another argument which UNESCO strongly promotes is that languages are the repositories of history and culture. Every language, every language community, everywhere in the world has oral history. The, record, the records of people's past, where they come from, their origins, their songs, the rituals, the stories, are all passed from generation to generation by word of mouth through oral history and culture. Only about a third of the world's languages are actually written down. Okay, Tibetan and Chinese have writing, but two-thirds of the world's languages are not written. <coughs> How is this passed on? Through the spoken language. You lose the language, you have lost the links to the culture and the history. Another argument is that language contributes to the sum of human knowledge. We as human beings can understand best who we are by virtue of appreciating the amazing differences and diversities of ways of speaking, ways of thinking, cultural activities around the world. Every language represents a different view of the world and should be appreciated as such. And then, of course, linguists like me are going to say, yes, because languages are fabulous. We love them. They're really great. And wouldn't it be a tragedy if mm, disappeared, you know, with all of its wonderful sounds and so on. So I think there are lots and lots of arguments about why we should be feeling, why we should be caring about this, and we need to place these against a very common opinion, particularly from people who speak just one language, that this is not important. 
Is it a hopeless situation then? I've said to you, given you kind of the bad news, languages are disappearing around the world, they are under threat. Is it entirely hopeless? Is there nothing that can be done? Well, there is some evidence that language shift can be reversed. Welsh today has more children speaking it than it has had for 100 years. Okay, Welsh in the United Kingdom. As a result of um, grassroots activity combined with um, government support, teaching in schools and support for, cu for cultural activities, there are really through immersion bilingual education programs, there are now children who speak Welsh whose parents don't or whose parents are semi-speakers, maybe understand but don't speak it fluently. The Welsh language was in decline and has been in decline, but the last census shows that the number of children who speak it is actually increasing and the language loss has stopped. Then we have the situation of Maori in New Zealand. About 25 years ago, Maori community realized that older people were using the language, but children were um, shifting to speaking English, and they created language nests. <coughs> this has generated language nests where, where little children whose parents don't speak Maori were brought together with grandparents. And the instruction was, while the kids are in the room in the daycare, only speak to them in Maori. And as a result, we actually have a whole generation of kids now who have grown up with Maori. Um, uh, who didn't have it through the, through the home, through their families. Um, <coughs> Hawaiians have created a similar model um, to the Maori one, and there are something like a thousand children who speak Hawaiian now. Um, about 25 years ago, there was just a single island with 200 people who spoke Hawaiian. Now we have a thousand kids who are studying Hawaiian, learning Hawaiian, through the language nest situation and the primary schools. Taiwan has recently reversed its monolingual language policy and introduced education, through education, um, training of Aboriginal speakers for the indigenous languages of Taiwan, the Austronesian languages, not Chinese, these are local indigenous languages, and we've seen a massive shift in, in the approach by the Taiwanese government and the introduction of education, mother tongue education in Taiwan. And I can give you other examples. Mexico changed its language policy two years ago, and there are um, moves there for the training of teachers, Mayan teachers in particular in Chiapas State, where um, we see this reversal taking place. So there are positive indicators around the world that communities are addressing these issues through a combination of grassroots activity in the communities themselves, together with support from national and state um, structures and organizations. And we'll hear some more about what's happening in Tibet in relation to this um, later today, the grassroots versus the national and local policy issues. So what can we do? What can we as um, individuals do about this? Well, there are a number of different possibilities. Um, people who are interested in language or linguistics or, or policy can work on documentation, protection and support for endangered languages, working with communities, understanding patterns of language use, and providing reliable and comprehensible information. Very frequently in communities, people don't understand what's actually going on. They will say things like, as the Navajos did a generation ago, Navajos, fine, we speak it at home, okay, it's okay, the kids will continue to learn it, and then you point out to them, actually, once they're out there playing with their brothers and sisters, they're speaking English to one another. So just informing the communities, informing groups about what's actually happening can be a very useful thing for us to do. In terms of language documentation, we can collect linguistic, social, and cultural data producing corpuses of audio, video, and text materials. Um, provide information about the social and political environment for communities and to archive these for future use. Um, very helpful often too is local community education, helping people to understand the situation of their language, to provide training opportunities for members of the community, particularly for language teaching, um, 
you know, simply the fact that you speak a language doesn't guarantee that you can teach that language. So we need to think about fostering uh, local people in terms of training and support. Supporting the language in a range of contexts. Spreading information is also very important. Disseminating information on all aspects of this, both within the community and also internationally. Um, you guys are interested. You're here today to hear about this. Go away and tell another 10 people or another 20 people and we can spread this story so that the kind of negative view that is often presented by dominant communities can be addressed. So what's being done? I just want to very quickly show you some examples of the kind of work that is being done around the world to deal with, um, address these issues of endangered languages. The Dorbes project is uh, funded by the Volkswagen uh, Foundation in, in Germany. Has so far expended about 30 million euros to uh, support 50 teams of researchers around the world documenting languages and cultures in a wide range of community contexts. They have set up a major archive of language materials in the Netherlands and developed new software tools and new um, computer methods for doing this kind of research. Um, this map shows you the current distribution of the, um, of the projects. The only one I think they're supporting in China is Salar Mongguo, which is in um, the uh, Mongolian group in, in western China. Uh, but otherwise, you can see the distribution is around the world. Another major project is the one that I'm involved uh, with in London. This is the Hands for Housing Endangered Languages project. If you're interested, there is a flyer uh, out the front. Please take a copy of this. It gives you an idea of some of the work that we're doing. Basically, we distribute about $2 million in a year in grant um, support. Um, we are currently supporting 150 teams of researchers, nothing like the 1,000 that, that you quoted before. The projects, our project's been going for five years, and we're currently supporting 150 teams. Um, we have a major digital archive at SOAS. Uh, we have currently four terabytes of data that has been coming in from the teams. That's 4,000 gigabytes of material, and the, that, the amount is increasing um, very rapidly. I run an academic program at SOAS, training masters, PhD, and postdoctoral researchers, and we regularly run workshops and conferences and publish some books. So there are some sample copies of the books that we produce out there, and we have a very active website, which I would encourage you to have a look at. And these are the projects, uh, 150 dots on there. Um, there are some projects uh, that are operating in China in a number of languages, in Wutunhua, for example. Uh, Walunge is a Tibetan language spoken in Nepal. Uh, Kurtup is a Tibetan language spoken in, in uh, Bhutan, which we are supporting research on. So there is activity happening in minority languages um, in the part of the world that many of you are interested in. If you want more details, there's a flyer, I, there's some, there were some copies of our annual report. If you want more information, just send me an email, get in touch via the addresses here. Other responses, the United States government is supporting this through the uh, joint program between the National Science Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities. They are distributing around $2 million a year. Uh, Doug Whalen, who's sitting over here, used to be in charge of that program. Um, and uh, this has just been made a permanent activity of the National Science Foundation. So that money will continue in perpetuity as long as the US government continues to support the NSF. And that's available. If anyone here wants to do research on endangered languages, you can apply for that funding. There are a number of smaller groups. The Foundation for Endangered Languages based in Britain. The Endangered Languages Fund, Doug is the president, if you would like to speak to him or find out. I think he, you have some flyers out there about the ELF as well. And there's this another fund based in Germany. These are smaller ones, they operate at a very much a grassroots level. But there are hundreds and hundreds of groups around the world who are activated and working in these areas. And we are starting to get some fantastic information about what are good techniques, good ways to to store the material, to look after it for the long-term future um, of communities and languages. UNESCO has been providing um, political support 
in terms of intangible cultural heritage, holding conferences and um, uh, sponsoring um, good practices in these, these kinds of areas. So there's a lot of international activity <coughs> that's happening um, that's really developed in the last five or six years. It's very new. And um, there is, for the first time, for, for people working in this area, there's a large amount of money available. We're talking millions of, of uh, in terms of support for research projects. Um, one final thing that I can mention is this is an idea that we have um, been developing at SOAS, and this is one that, that I would encourage you to promote amongst your friends, and particularly uh, um, people who, who don't uh, speak minority languages. What we're saying is, think of this in terms of a language footprint, similar to the sort of carbon footprint idea. A language footprint is the influence speakers of a dominant language have on the behavior of speakers of other languages. This, I'll, I'll just very quickly go through this. There is a flyer that you can take away um, and have a look at. So the idea is, if you're involved in communication and you start speaking, and the result is the other person speaks your language, then you've made a language footprint. If you're bilingual and you choose the dominant language when you could have chosen the minority language, you've made a language footprint. Now you can reduce your language footprint in various ways. You can do it by learning other languages, particularly less commonly um, spoken languages. Use a local translator. If you go on holidays to somewhere, don't force the other people to speak in English or in Spanish to you, but learn something of the local language and culture or use a local translator. Support languages by buying books in them, encouraging companies to do marketing and packaging in local languages, and uh, basically supporting linguistic diversity. Okay, maybe you can say, well, I can't, I'm not very good at learning languages. I can't do that, you know? So what I can do is I can offset my language footprint by supporting other activities. Increase language learning in a country. Taking holidays in places where your language isn't intrusive. Support efforts of language maintenance in other communities. And helping people to become aware of language diversity and the problem of language endangerment. So English speakers can support other groups by offsetting their language footprint. And if you're a bilingual, you can balance your language footprint by consciously choosing to use your language when you have a choice. So instead of speaking in Spanish, you can watch, um, uh, you, can, you can go to the local market and operate in your local indigenous language, for example, or watch films or TV in minority languages, support language publication, etc. So the idea here is to push this as, <coughs> as a kind of an alternative um, to the carbon footprint issue in terms of uh, developing language footprint. So at an individual level, individuals can make choices and to support and sponsor and do positive things about their own languages. Not to stand back and say, oh, everybody's not talking my language anymore. You can positively do something to make a change. So this is a new kind of metaphor. Instead of talking about, oh, languages are dying and we can't do anything and so on, I want you to go away with the idea that there are thousands of people around the world, hundreds of projects who are working on these kinds of issues, and you as an individual can positively do something to support your own language, your own minority community, through local action that results in linguistic, ecological sustainability. These are the kinds of things that we are learning through this process of addressing um, endangered languages and um, the kind of shift that's taking place. Um, I think what I'll do is, I, I was going to give you an example from Australia, but I've run out of time for that. So what I'll actually do is skip to um, my conclusions in terms of what uh, this sort of global picture that um, I would like to paint for you. Um, the, the story essentially is that um, in Australia, um, Australia is, a, is in a very negative linguistic situation with 95% of the indigenous languages having been destroyed. When Europeans first arrived, there were 250 languages. Today, 12 are spoken by children. In 200 years, Australia has managed to destroy 95% of its um, indigenous languages. Um, uh, heritage. 
However, in places in, around the country, there is revitalization of languages taking place. And what we can see is that the result of this is that in many communities, it's never too late to start working on revitalization. Even where people might say, oh, there's nothing left, there's only a few old speakers, there's just very little information, it has been shown, we have shown that it is possible to get children relearning these languages, to be exposed to them, to encourage them. There is an essential role for good language documentation and resources. If you want to strengthen and revitalize and support languages, you must have good documentary materials, good video, good audio, good text, good stories. That must be there to support the revitalization development. It is important to have clear goals, clear functions, and clear ideas about the politics and the ideology. Um, in the Australian case, the ideology was a very straightforward one. Our language is our identity. Okay? We, we are Wiradjuri because we speak the Wiradjuri language. That very simple correlation resulted in people wanting to learn the language. The second thing they decided was that the language should have iconic functions. There was no goal to start speaking the language all the time, everywhere but to have particular functions for it, to be used as an indicator of who you are and to, to use it for things like speeches and interactions and, and meetings and so on. A clear direction that's come out of the work that we've been doing in Australia for the last 20 years is the importance of grassroots activity amongst community members combined together with government recognition and support and resources. Okay, you can struggle again at the kind of um, grassroots level, uh, but you also need pressure to be placed um, in terms of policy and recognition. And the final point is collaboration has been the key to the kinds of activities that we have seen. Collaboration between linguists, between teachers, indigenous specialists, local custodians of knowledge, and the result has been very concrete outcomes. Outcomes not just in the use of language, but very positive outcomes in terms of people's perceptions of who they are and positive evaluation of themselves. Self-esteem, for example. In many indigenous communities in Australia, children are not going to school because they just couldn't be bothered. They can't see the point. They're goofing off. They're getting into drugs terrible alcoholic problems with even with young children by reintroducing language by supporting and revitalizing the culture the result has been that there's been a shift away from that negative self-esteem towards a positive evaluation of people as individuals as members of groups as contributors toward the society so language there has played a really crucial role in terms of developing social good as well as linguistic aspects I think you should not forget that as an important aspect of addressing these problems, these issues, in relation to global threats to language diversity. Thank you very much.